You are listening to Paz de Chipotle, the show that will take you to discover the edible treasures of Mexico. Episode 18. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Paz de Chipotle, the audible companion of Sabor, This is Mexican Food, a digital magazine dedicated to exploring the markets, streets, recipes, and traditions that make Mexico an edible paradise. I'm your host, Rocío Carvajal, food historian, cook, and author. To find more information about this project, please go to pazdechipotle.com. Find the show on Twitter as Chipotle Podcast. Hello, everybody. It's great to be back after this short hiatus. I hope you're all tackling 2018 and getting on with new and exciting projects. As you may have seen on my social media accounts and newsletter, I have been commissioned to do the photography and food styling of an upcoming book called Food Stories Fostering Cross-Cultural Dialogue Through Food. So far, I have met amazingly talented Greek, Turkish, Japanese, Palestinian, Nigerian, Russian and Chinese cooks and entrepreneurs that teach, cook and are part of the ever so diverse food community in London. I myself was invited to be featured in this book, in which I will share three of my favorite recipes, mancha mantel stew, black bean soup and rose petal ice cream with crunchy buñuelos which, incidentally, will be part of a supper club I'll be offering in Peckham, London. Links will be available on this episode's blog post. Today's episode features an interview that was recorded last year in Mexico, when I sat with Douglas Collin, author of the Mexican Food Journal. It was such an enjoyable conversation, in which Douglas's contagious enthusiasm to share with the world his amazement and enjoyment of Mexican food will really make you smile and crave the simple pleasure of eating a freshly made tortilla. It might surprise you to know that Mexico is a main destination for American citizens to relocate, whether they are young professionals in search for business opportunities or pensioners who head down to live the Mexican dream. There are entire regions that today are well-known destinations for baby boomers. Small colonial cities like San Miguel de Allende, Puerto Vallarta, Los Cabos, Querétaro and Valle de Bravo, and have even experienced a real estate bubble due to the high demand of premium properties. According to a study published by Mexico's National Institute of Geography and Statistics, There were, back in 2015, 739,168 American citizens living in Mexico. All in all, Mexico hosts the largest community of American expats in the world. But how exactly these immigrants interact with Mexico and its culture? Well, many of them form micro-communities and pretty much embrace a life of daily suntans and margarita parties. There's nothing wrong with that. But many others take the opportunity to approach life in a whole different way. They learn Spanish, bond with the local community, and discover the vast cultural heritage of Mexico with new eyes and open curiosity. And that is exactly what makes Douglas a very special person, and it's a true joy to see his enthusiasm and admiration for Mexico and its culture. Douglas is an American expat who relocated in Mexico more than 20 years ago and has traveled extensively in the country, working in higher education and teaching related projects until his journeys and the constant and not always easy interaction with Mexican culture and food awoke his interest to explore and understand the riot of flavors that at first sight Mexican food seemed to be. Today, more than ever, we need to build and cross proverbial bridges of multicultural dialogue. 
The main obstacles to achieving a long-lasting, enriching and respectful exchange begins by looking beyond cultural stereotypes and taking time to listen and experience our cultural expressions. And what better way to start than with food? And it was precisely gastronomy that led my guest to find the perfect gateway not only to help him in his own way to relate to Mexican culture, but to inspire others to do the same. And through his digital platform from Mexican Food Journal, he provides a way for second or third generation Mexicans to rebond with their heritage, foodie travelers to have a richer experience and escape tourist traps, and to resident expats to have a friendly guide to walk them through the overwhelmingly vast world that is Mexican cuisine. I hope you enjoy and feel inspired by this conversation, just as much as we did recording it. Douglas, uh, welcome to the show. I'm really happy to have you here. Well, thank you. Douglas, you really, really have an enviable position to help us understand what uh, challenging the conceptions about authentic Mexican food in America means. In a way, you have like one foot here and one foot there. Like, which is the general sort of conception about Mexican food and culture in America, that is the US? Why do you need it needs to change? Uh, because obviously that's what you are doing with your work. Um... Well, I think, uh, from my experience, my, before I moved to Mexico, um, you know, and I've been in Mexico for 24 years now, uh, you know, my idea of Mexican food was it was, you know, smothered in cheese and it was very greasy and very spicy. And being here, it's, it's quite different. There's a, you know, um, the range of flavors that's, it's not all cheese. It's all, not all melty cheese. It's not, um, there's a lot of dishes that are quite light, quite sophisticated, uh, vegetable dishes. Um, so I, I found that it wasn't what I thought when I moved here, you know, it's, it's more varied. It's more healthy than I thought. I think many people have the idea that Mexican food's terribly unhealthy, and I don't. I don't think that's true. I think there there are many dishes that are, but there are many that are not. It was like a like a true cultural shock, I suppose, when you first arrived. For me, it was a true cultural shock because as I I grew up in Southern California, although and there's a lot of Mexican food in Southern California, but I wasn't really a fan. I didn't grow up eating spicy food. It wasn't for me. I still remember the first day when I, I moved to stay. I was in Durango, Mexico for uh, for a teaching job and they, they took us out on the first day after we arrived for breakfast. You know, I ordered huevos rancheros and they were very, very spicy for me. It was super hot and I thought, I can't live here. I can't eat this food. Uh, it's, it's too much for me. It's just hot, you know, and, and I still remember it's like, how am I going to handle this? And it took kind of a while before I started to adapt to the food. I think I know speaking of misconceptions, I think one of the other things is all Mexican food is hot. And that's the idea that, you know, the, the more you crank up the heat, the better the dish is or the more, you know, everything has to be hot, hot, hot. And I think the way that people see chilies and the use of heat from the chilies in the dish is more, it's an enhancement, you know, not a competition to see how hot you can make something. Yes, of course. Honestly, just jumps to my head the image of Diana Kennedy. And like you, I mean, she, she didn't come obviously with a purpose of becoming uh, this uh, sort of unforeseen ambassador of Mexican food around the world. But she, she went through this gradual sort of phase of, of discovery, exploring the markets and talking with traditional cooks. So the fact that you came to Mexico to work in a completely different uh, field uh, and you effectively became a convert, was it that sort of first approach and experience that you sort of put into your work to help others, other American fellows, mm -hmm. initiating them in a way than helping them navigate the cultural differences? Uh, how wh What has been their response to that? So far, people have, I mean, I think really enjoyed it. Um, 
the way that I do the recipes in the blog and is from the point of view for my I got here I knew nothing you know you would go to the market you would see these amazing fruits and vegetables and chilies and I had no idea what to do with them you know they looked amazing but okay now what so I went through the process of of knowing really nothing about Mexican cooking to over time you know little by little um learned how to cook some dishes and, you know, got more experience with it. So when we do the the recipes for like for the website is to really to go kind of step by step so people can recreate the flavors from Mexico. There are certain steps and things here in Mexico that are really, really obvious to people because they've grown up cooking that way. You know, if you didn't learn it from birth, it's all new to you. So um, in, in that sense, I know where I think where many people have trouble or they're not sure and think, well, what do I do here? You know, you know, say, say you go to the market and you buy a poblano chili and you want to make chili, chiles rellenos. And so you think, OK, well, um, you know, you can see a picture and everything, but just the fact that you have to char the chili and you clean the chili and, and you may not, I'd never, I had never cooked with chilies before. So I would, I would never think of charring a chili and cleaning it to prepare it for the dish. And so, so hopefully, you know, the people can see here's really, really step by step. It's more set up for someone who may have some knowledge of the dishes. They may have tried many dishes, but they haven't prepared them. You have never seen the process either. You've never seen the process. You may, you may have had many chiles rellenos in your life, but the whole process of putting one together yep. is a different thing. And, and it's difficult online to explain sometimes the flavors that you're really, you're going for, that you're trying to create when you're cooking or what it should be like. But if you kind of, you know, follow the steps, you'll get the, the flavors from, from Mexico, the more, more authentic flavor. In a way, I think your work it's about explaining and translating, enabling people to share this experience, because it's much more than just knowing how to execute a recipe, but it's really a new possibility of enjoyment of food and what it means to prepare it. Because uh, there's been a slow but very consistent decline, not only in America, but also you know, in the whole of the <laughs> industrial world, and even in the developing world as well, of this healing, you know, like losing all this knowledge of how to feed yourself, how to prepare food. So I think the kind of work you're doing is really also touching those areas that you may not have had envisioned initially, but is effectively contributing to that. And previous to this interview in other chats we've had, you shared with me your concern mm -hmm. and even frustration to the almost pinhole view that mainstream American culture has about Mexico, where you sort of mentioned now how the perceptions about food are very different from what you experience here. Yet Mexico is still America's top holiday destination and also the main destination for relocation, not only for people who you know want to retire and, and live happily here, but also for young couples as well and business people who want to come and start mm -hmm. something completely different uh, in Mexico. And may I say also something that is not mentioned very often, that Mexico is also home to the largest illegal population of American immigrants. Do you think, uh, in your experience, the, the cultural richness of our culinary traditions helped in a way achieving a better mutual understanding of the cultures? Uh, I would say so. To me, you, you can't understand Mexican culture without understanding the food. The food, I mean, the food traditions, the family traditions that go with food are so important. When I first came down here, my first place, you know, where I spent an, ex an extended period of time was in Durango. And people would ask every day, they would ask you, oh, what did you have for lunch today? And I would think, that's a strange question. What do you care what I had for lunch? You know, like, why are you asking me this? It, it, because you didn't ask someone in California, what did you have for lunch? And they were very interested. And, and then you'd say, well, I, you know, I had, I had tacos or I had uh, enchiladas or whatever I, I had for lunch. And it's like, oh, wow, that's so great. That sounds so delicious. And I found that so odd. You know, why do people keep asking me about my lunch? But food is such an important topic and a part of the culture that, it, you know, it, it is important. So funny to me, that was a really funny thing. It's like, I wish people would stop asking me about my lunch, you know, because I didn't see lunch was something that, you know, between you know at work and school and everything you you wolf down some lunch to fill yourself up to keep going for the day and at the time in Durango lunch was still two hours 
So everybody had two hours. You ate a long lunch. You enjoyed it. Going back to the question about culture, I think to really understand here, the food is such an integral part of the culture that you can't separate it. So I definitely, if you start to understand the food, how people enjoy food, how they prepare food, you you can understand the culture more. Absolutely. And I think you've really nailed a critical point. That is a major cultural difference. So for many uh, countries, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, and there's lots of cultural theories as to why these occurs. Food has tended to become more and more a less social event and more just fuel to carry on working. And the the lunch hours have reduced increasingly. So like you say, it's just a pick me up between breakfast and, and the second shift. The fact that food has such an important role in Mexican culture, I think it goes down mm -hmm. and, and you obviously uh, have experienced this. It's a social event. It's an occasion for bonding. You know, you share that with strangers, with friends, with colleagues. Uh, if you're lucky with your family, if you have time to go back home and, and have a quick lunch. It's the time where people talk. And this actually shocks, you know, uh, p people from other cultures. Are like, you talk over breakfast or you talk over lunch? Yes, like, mm -hmm. it's the most precious time for families and friends to bond over mm -hmm. food because uh, food also ends up becoming an event, however humble or simple mm -hmm. the occasion or no occasion. But we make it special by sharing it. So how did you sort of got to experience this transition then? Well, the whole transition, you know, at first it was, I found it kind of annoying. It's like two hours for lunch. What do you need two hours for lunch for? And it took a few months to kind of get into it. And then after a while, it's like, well, this actually isn't so bad. You know, that you, you can sit down and enjoy your lunch. And it's a, um, you know, it's a more... It is a more social time, and um, the transition was very gradual. It's nothing, I don't think that in general I didn't really think about it. You just, you know, things started to make sense because at first it didn't make sense, and then, you know, it has a logic to it that you may not see at the beginning, and then as you learn more about life in Mexico, you kind of see how th things fit together. I don't think, again, I don't think I thought about the transition that much. The first thing struck me as very odd. It's like, uh, why, why is lunch so long? And even that the, one of the other things that struck me at the beginning is the, the time that you eat is different. Lunch is the big meal of the day and it's a little bit later than lunch in the U.S. And dinner is a light, that's, that's a light meal. And in, in the U.S., dinner is the big meal, but it's also earlier. Yes. And, you know, going the other way, people ask me, how can you eat dinner so early? You know, how can you eat a heavy dinner? Because then you go to bed and it's, you know, it's just sitting heavy in your stomach. Yeah, yeah. Um, I said, but we'll actually eat probably two or three hours earlier. Yes, it's true. And then so, you know, so the perception here was, you know, you're almost harming yourself by having a big dinner. You should have a big lunch and a light dinner. And that's actually one thing that after all these years, for me, dinner is still the main meal and lunch is in the American way. You know, it's a lighter, it's the middle of the day until you go home and have your big meal. I was exactly But, going to uh, ask that, like, uh, how, how does food work in the Cullen house? <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I guess for us, it's, it's still more, lunch is light. We, we actually don't do, um, the big lunch unless we're going out to eat. We do eat dinner at Mexican time, so that's somewhere around eight o'clock. And we definitely eat foods that would be considered breakfast foods in the U.S. We eat a lot of eggs for dinner, you know, sometimes even have a bowl of cereal. And we do a lot of migas. Um, my, my wife is from northern Mexico. That's like super common. For those who don't know what migas are, it's basically you take some old tortillas and you, you fry them in a little bit of oil till they're crisp and you, you mix in some eggs and it's scrambled and top it with salsa. You explain it a little bit more. It's like a, an eggy version of chilaquiles. Well, through this process, then, I, uh, I really appreciate the refreshing and candid way in which you say you did like Mexican food when you first came and, uh, and that it changed gradually. So what motivated you to, you know, get started in, in the way that you are totally immersed now? Was it like a self-guided exploration or was there anyone that sort of guided you through it? Uh, I would say more self-guided. It was just that, you know, I, I like cooking and, you know, little by little I would try something out or think I'm going to try and make a, a salsa. 
you know, after you do it a few times, you start to kind of, you figure it out, how the ingredients start to come together. And cooking would be my hobby. And, and I like that you can go to the market and you can discover things. And one of the fun things about living here is if you go to the markets, you can ask somebody, hey, what on earth is this chili? What do you do with it? What do people make with it here? And so they'll, they'll tell you more or less, you know, okay, here's a chili. Here's the kind of salsa that we make it or the, what dish we put it into. And so you can get a lot of knowledge that you wouldn't get going from the supermarket. But if you go to the local market, so, so that's kind of fun. And, you know, it's an, in exploration, you learn something new, learn something interesting, and you can learn, you learn about the local dishes because every town has their way of preparing dishes, even if it's a similar dish. So yeah, it's just kind of little by little, and I, and I can't tell you exactly at one point, but at some point I realized, wow, there's more to chilies than just hot. Yes. <laughs> different chilies have different flavors because for the first, I don't know, X number of months or years, all chilies were just hot. That's the only sensation that I got from eating them. And it was only red and, and green. I yeah, it was red and green, but it was basically it was it was hotter, hotter to me. And that was about all that I could tell. Okay. You know, from the taste. And at some point I realized, well, actually, you know, that a dish that has chile serrano in it tastes different than a dish that has a chili jalapeno. They actually have a different flavor. When I became used to things that had some, uh, you know, some heat in them, and little by little I could discern the flavors. You know, asking questions at the market. I guess a little bit of my background, you know, um, sort of my my studies or my university, it's sort of culture and language. You know, I have a degree in social sciences and, you know, a master's in teaching English as a second language. You know, language and culture are interesting to me and, and food also and because food is an integral part of culture. So I think it was just a, a curiosity that I, I enjoyed finding out new things and trying new dishes. And, and I still find it interesting that I learned the names of the chilies in northern Mexico, and now I'm in central Mexico, and the names of the of the chilies change, and people correct me all the time. It's like, that's that's not what it's called, and it's like, one thing, but to me it is, because that's how I learned it, and in central Mexico and Guanajuato, they call it like the chili huajillo, they call it the, the cascabel ancho, and to me, the cascabels are the ones that look like the little little rattles. When I say cascabel, and then they hand me the the, the chili guajillo, and they and I said, oh, no, but don't you have the re the regular cascabel? And they said, but this is a regular cascabel. I said, no, 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 the the little round ones. Oh no, we don't have those. Those aren't cascabel. That's not a chili cascabel. And they give you the chili guajillo, and they call it the guajillo ancho. But you know, it's it's little little things like that that I find interesting. And you kind of figure out how the pieces fit together, and how people see food, and what they prepare with it. Well, it's it's very clear that you obviously have a passion for teaching. After all, well, like you said, you know, you've been uh, teaching for a number of years and talking a bit about your work on um, the Mexican Food Journal. So apart from having this really nice blog where loads of people go to get recipes and, and you have built a very large community there, uh, you reach loads of um uh, foodist and mainly American foodist, uh, which is something very interesting. Uh, you started doing, in Mexico, uh, private cooking classes. Mm -hmm. Would you share with the audience, sort of um, walk us through a bit, uh, sort of the dynamics you've been developing for, for your classes and what's been the reaction of people like uh, you mentioned to me earlier before we started the interview, how you start introducing flavors and textures to them. So uh, how do you find uh, the way you are approaching your classes to this awakening for, for people into Mexican food? Um, I like to teach and I think the blog is teaching and I, I do the cooking classes when, when I have a chance. It's very informal. I always explain it to people. It's like this is, it's a cooking class, but it's more like, uh, you're cooking in a friend's kitchen. It's not a, le a lecture course. A little bit, you know, I try to condense the whole process of, of learning about all these new flavors into, into a few hours. You know, exposing people, the thing, uh, the taste of a corn tortilla, a, an actual, a traditionally made corn tortilla with made of ground corn, not the ground, you know, the cornmeal that you can buy at the supermarket. That was a really mind-blowing experience because 
my my idea of what a corn tortilla was before I came here was the ones that came in the plastic bags that are on the shelves at the supermarket, and I never liked them. I thought they tasted terrible, and I couldn't understand why anybody thought you know corn corn tortillas were great until I came here. And then you know that it's it's prepared in the moment from ground corn. There's just no comparison, but it has a rich, deep corn flavor. So the ones in the plastic bag taste kind of like plasticky cardboard. We will do a taste test of corn tortillas. The corn, the tortilla is such an integral part of, of the meal. I think most people have the idea that a tortilla is a holder for the filling. You know, and really the tortilla is a complement to everything else. You know, the, t- the filling goes together with the tortilla. If you're having a taco, for example, the filling plus the salsa, plus, you know, if you add any of the ex- onion and cilantro, and it all works together in the corn tortilla, you should taste it. And so to do a taste test, I buy the supermarket corn tortillas in a plastic bag. I buy f- fresh tortillas that are made with the corn flour. Um, that you, that you can buy at the grocery store, and then I do a freshly made tortilla that's made with masa, the actual dough uh, from the ground corn. Most people have never had, you know, a true what I would call a true tortilla, and so that really opens people's eyes because that was some I didn't know that until they came here. I try to share that with with people so you can see there's maybe more to Mexican cuisine. The flavors are different than what you know. You just see their eyes get wide when they have a really great tortilla. I think I'm also trying to give people sort of a point of reference. And when they go home and cook it, it won't taste like the one that I made for them or they made with me. So when they start, now they know, aha, okay, it's supposed to taste like this. And now I know I'm in the ballpark. I'm close to what it really should taste like. Yeah, and you uh, touched something that is very Mexican, I would say. And the listeners might remember the interview with Meli Martinez when we talked about something that is so embedded in the mm-hmm. Mexican culture, which is the concept of sazón. And personal sazón uh, mm-hmm. is nothing more than the personal touch. So, like you say, you mm-hmm. may have the same range of ingredients. Actually, you may have the same kitchen, two people uh, preparing exactly the same dish, and it's going to taste different. Well, there's the um, sort of scientific explanation of that, which is, of course, like Meli also was sharing, the oil in your hands, probably this the speed uh, uh, in which you stir things and the heat and these little changes. But also, you know, the right point of when you know it's done and you know when it's done because exactly those uh, reference points that you just mm-hmm. mentioned, which, of course, in the case of Mexican people, and, you know, for the matter, for any other traditional cuisine, those are the, the flavors that, uh, you know, sort of shape your palate from when you are a kid. So, like, if, if I will attempt now mm-hmm. cooking something that is traditional in your family probably uh, wouldn't do it that well because it wouldn't taste like say your grandma's favorite cake no? mm-hmm. and, and and it has right. nothing to do with my cooking skills but precisely with this other added issue so do you sort of explain this uh, concept of sazon We talk about sazón, the emotion of the person that's cooking. From my personal experience, if I'm in a bad mood, my food is lousy. It doesn't come out the same in in the sense of sazón. And here, especially like uh, where I am now, people talk a lot about like sazón, not only from it's your personal touch, but it's also you have it or you don't. Um, You know, because some people have sazón and things things come out really well and it's it's a little bit of like that little extra magic that somebody has it takes the same ingredients the same recipe and it just comes out better yeah yeah and so here in in central mexico where i am now it um people talk a lot it's like ah this particular senor that you hear from that she lives in the neighborhood she has sazon and it's that's a high compliment (laughs) you know if someone has sazon you know they have the magic yeah, yes, absolutely. And that extra <laughs> special touch. In general, the people who have sazón are the people that enjoy what they're doing, that love cooking. Uh, and the people who don't have sazón, they may be decent cooks and the food tastes fine, but it doesn't have the magic because the love doesn't go into it. I was going to say that, yes, we, we like to attribute it to to the intention behind it, the love you put in it. I, I remember being at an event and they were making the Otomi ceremonial tortillas. If you've seen them, they're the tortillas. They actually are printed 
Uh, they play with like when it's an engraved design on them, they have a stamp and they stamp the tortillas. Yeah. And the tortillas were puffing up really nicely. I was I was with the woman who was making them. I was asking questions how she was doing them and the history of the tortillas. And she stopped and complimented me. And she said, you have really good energy because the tortillas are puffing up beautifully. They'll only puff up for people they like. It was really, really important. Cause she said, that, said you'll notice with tortillas that if, if people have negative energy, they won't puff up because they're not happy. And that sort of thing is like you when you're cooking in the U.S., I don't know of people talking that way about the food. The food's not responding because you have bad energy. Of course, the way uh, the, the cooking techniques that are used for preparing, say, uh, you know, the American cookbook probably, that it always involves loads of equipment. Whereas in Mexico, it's pretty much, you know, your skills and your hands is the main uh, yes. utensil. Well, going back to the cooking classes, that's one of the other things that I say. Like, you can't cook Mexican food if you don't put your hands in the food. Yes. You can't, if you're mixing masa for tamales, you can't put it in the stand mixer and have them come out the same as if you mix it by hand. That magic point where the after you've mixed it for a while, it comes together and it has the right texture. You can only feel it when you are mixing. You can only feel it. So you can say, put it in the stand mixer and mix for two minutes, for example. But at two minutes, you won't know that it's got to that point where it's right. You want people to know you've got to touch the food with your hands. And, you know, and I tell people when they're out, watch when you're around town, when you go to the taco stand, but they flip the tortilla on the griddle with their fingers. They don't use a spatula. You, you do everything, you do everything with your hands and everything, you have to feel it and you know. And that's, that's a real difference because growing up, when you cooked, you used utensils for everything. You touched the food with utensils, but you didn't just shove your hands into the food. That's strange or even wrong. In a way, it says it's not playing with your food, but you have to, you have to touch the food because if you don't not touch the food, you don't know. And, you know, and, it, and for people, it sounds, you know, it's like, well, that's, you know, kind of out there. You have to touch the food. You have to feel it. You have to have good energy. And it's like, don't you just follow the recipe and it comes out? And it's like, well, not really. It becomes almost a, a spiritual experience. Yeah. And so, but yeah, getting people, touch the food, work the masa, work the dough. You have to work it with your hands and you'll figure it out. And if you don't do it, it won't come out the same. I guess the great cultural wealth that's embedded in gastronomies and or traditional cuisines it's obviously very uh, important to recognize the effort of people who have become stewards of these traditions to keep them alive to also uh, transmit them to the next generations and now because the interconnected world we live in we even have this possibility of being nurtured again from these traditional cuisines that will that are enabling us to get back in touch with, I would say, the essence of what food means as a social and cultural product that brings all the community together, that brings the family together, and not just because we are physically sitting around a table, but because we are all taking part in you know, looking after each other, doing something, like you say, with your with your hands for each other. So there is nothing wrong, obviously, I mean, nothing intrinsically wrong with the way food and preparation has uh, changed in, in the industrial world, because obviously it has lots of very good reasons why it got there. You know, the industrial revolution, and then uh, obviously the effect of the of the post-war periods where you had to be very efficient with what you had and use uh, whatever utensils you had at hand to reduce time uh, preparing that because you needed that time for working. So obviously it has a cultural reason. But what it has taken from us, that is the, the personal encounter with this act of nourishing each other. No? Mm -hmm. The way that you do the food here, the, when you touch it with your hands and everything, and it's it's still it is personal. 
you know, you can use utensils and it does come out the same, but it's that I think it's it's a bit more conscious about what you're doing. You can put it in the in the stand mixer. If you're making the masa, you put it in the stand mixer and do two minutes. You're no longer aware of if it's at its, you know, its peak point. If you're making masa for tamales, if peak point to make a really nice tamale that comes out that just, you know, has the certain amount of weight to it, but it's still fluffy at the same time. So going back to your blog and how it has uh, changed, you know, in my own experience as well, when you start an online project and in the case of a, of a food blog, uh, it sort of goes to different stages of not only trying to see what works, but also your own voice as a recipe writer and, and, and the way you want to share your work and the way people respond to it sort of shifts uh, over time. I know now that you have started working with a Mexican photographer and have started a, a very nice project uh, doing fine prints of chiles, no less. So uh, would you like to share something about this new uh, thing you are exploring uh, in your in your website? Yeah, with, as you mentioned, when you start the blog, you have sort of an idea of what you want to do and it changes as you go. And as uh, probably like most blogs, I would say mine started off pretty Pretty awful, <laughs> and you know, little by little, and then um, it gets better. And then I started, you know, then a photographer friend, you know, we we're talking about, um, you know, I was telling him about the blog that I was working on and everything, and he'd be interested in working with me to do pictures, and so yeah, which greatly improved the quality of of the photography and the recipes. And his name is Andres Carnaya. This photographer is fantastic. So so yeah, so we've started working and. We've actually just started with a, a line of uh, of T-shirts and and prints based on chilies to try and give sort of the essence of the chili that you guys should wear as a T-shirt or you can hang it in your wall because they look really great as a. So in my case, because I'm working with a really great photographer, that adds a little something extra. Kind of captures the essence here and explains it from, you know, in, in visually explains it from the Mexican point of view. And so that's something I think that, uh, is, is unique to what we're doing. Also, a little known fact is that Mexico is, well, pretty much responsible for the presence of 90% of the varieties of chiles in the world. And oddly enough, most people think that chiles come from Asia. Like, no, 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 Mexican chiles are fine, but the good chiles are from Asia. They're all Mexican. Right. Uh-huh. <laughs> so uh, you paying this very stylish homage to chiles, of course, is something to be celebrated. And we are almost reaching the end of the interview. But I would like to mention something uh, that I've noticed you've been working on recently. You are doing some workshops as well as like a separate or side project, cooking workshops with children. And that is something that really excites me for a number of reasons. So that's a whole new different side of your work that sort of leans more towards food literacy, which, in my opinion, should be part of a holistic education in the sense that it should be part of your life skills. Do tell us how did this, uh, this side project start and is, if there are any plans to continue. Well, the, I think the side project you're, you're, you're mentioning is, um, is with the, the Waldorf School in, in San Miguel yes. de Allende. And, but we were invited one of their instructors because that's an integral part of the, of the education they do there is just working with food. And I think as you said, having some sort of food literacy, you know, and it's, it's kind of part of the, um, the whole package to get the kids used to eat, just eating whole foods. And so, you know, so they invited us along to participate with that. And in, in, in a couple of years in the past, I participated in a few events where took uh, kids from a school out to an organic farm and they got to pick vegetables and the things that they picked they they did did a benefit dinner for the school and the kids cooked traditional dishes it kind of every level i i want to encourage people to cook more to, you know in my personal life i try to eat a little better try to eat less processed foods there's a there's a magic to cooking and there's a magic to when you make something and i think it's part of it is the you know that you make something with your hands it's nice to be able to participate and to pass on an interest and a love and for something that you know if, if 
the kids get into cooking, um, then it's something that, that in the long run will really benefit them. You know, that they can, they can have great experiences cooking. They can eat better food that's healthier for them that will, you know, will, will do them well for their whole life. Yes, yes. I, I guess in um, hyper modern societies, children are, I think, you know, way sort of taken off the opportunity to do this. And it's not, again, I don't think really there is a bad intention behind it. I'm sure parents do their absolute best to, to educate, feed their children, of course, but, and, and to provide them, them with, you know, uh, the best they can and even not allowing them to cook because, you know, but involving them in this process is part of, of what will make them happy and self-sufficient people as well. Uh, do you think you will continue? I mean, the, from this invitation? Um, I think, um, yeah, I think there's there's an opportunity to do more with the, the school again and other activities or to come, you know, we can come and, and show them some, some recipes and, you know, just some sense of where food comes from was interesting. So, you know, that people, uh, that's kind of getting lost and it's like, wow, carrots come from dirt. And not, you know, not from, not from the refrigerator case at the supermarket, you know. And so I'm sure, I'm sure there will be more opportunities to do that kind of thing. And, and kids have lots of energy and, you know, that's, it's all fresh and new to them. I was going to say, I mean, teaching or sharing in whatever way, it's always such a rewarding uh, experience and mm -hmm. enriching. So uh, just wrapping up. So what are the new projects for uh, the Mexican Food Journal? Um, what have you envisioned? For, for your project to become, obviously, uh, the website is, uh, what it is, is a platform that enables you to do other things. So, uh, what do you see, uh, your project going in the following year? I think over the next year, one of the things that, um, I've done a little bit with and I would want to work more is actually doing classes online. Okay. I've done classes online for small groups, but to open it up more, as you said, is more of a platform. There would be a scheduled course, say, say once a week, um, for two hours where we make a certain dish and I walk you through the steps of, of, okay, yeah. you know, this is, this is how you make a simple red mole. Because mm -hmm. the recipes are really good, but in a recipe where you get in the cooking class is that, okay, as this, as the mole sauce is coming together, it kind of passes through stages and we taste it and you can taste how it goes from being undercooked and not have until it hits that sort of magic point where the sauce really comes together, the flavor is developed. And, and you know what I mean? Like it, when you're making a, when you're making a mole and as you're cooking, as you taste it, as it's cooking, there's a point where you would just say it still tastes raw. And then, um, and it's hard to explain that just through a recipe that you have to keep tasting it. But then there's sort of a magic point that it cooks for approximately this amount of time and then and you'll know when it gets there if you've tasted it if you have that frame of reference and so but to do the online things and some people learn better from watching videos and everything's going to video now you know the recipes are good but it's sort of the next step to be able to explain things even better mm -hmm. and to really show maybe simple steps that are are more difficult to explain in writing or um with photographs, but where you can actually see it as it comes together. And, you know, part, and part of the cooking classes is they don't always, things don't always work perfectly. Yes, and it's like, yes, oh, yes. well, you know, that something goes wrong or how do you fix it? Or, you know, like, and so those are the sort of things that you wouldn't see in a recipe. Like, ah, okay, you know, if, if this is happening, then do this, you know, um, we, so we can actually teach better using that or as a complement to the, to the written and the uh, recipes with the photography. Okay. So what do you think, uh, because I'm sure many listeners will be already interested. Uh, uh, so that happen in the next year. Uh, you know, that around in January is um, it'll start coming together. I've done I've done some small, you know, sort of more one on one lessons or one to a small group lessons. But these are would now be open, you know, a cooking course. And, you know, each week is a, is a different dish and we go through. And so it's more like a course, but anybody can participate. Oh, that sounds fantastic. So, uh, you know, I've done it on a small scale, but now to open it up to bigger groups. That sounds really interesting as well. And I had to write down and say it again because I just found it 
and music. They just said simple and mole in the same phrase. Only someone who's very skilled already in making moles would say something like that. But, uh, the, uh, there's one in particular, it's a red mole, I call it the everyday mole. Because it really doesn't have that, um, it doesn't have that many ingredients. Most moles you can actually do in the in the period of a cooking class. It just takes too long. Yes. Because yes. the quantity, the ingredients, the steps that you have to do. But it's actually a pretty simple a red mole from Oaxaca. You know, and I have my take on it. And so you can actually over over um, a few hours put it together. Yeah. Yeah. But, but a lot of the moles are not simple. They're time consuming. They're not that hard to make. It just takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. They're very absolutely laborious. What would it be then if you could say your favorite moment or, or a turning point, like that made you said, I'm going to show the world this because the world needs to know this. And the other question, and that's the final one, uh, What is your favorite Mexican dish? Okay. Well, let's see. I think the reason I did it, I think probably just comes down to I like telling people about stuff I like. I, I wouldn't call it a grand epiphany, but it, it it's like, you know, this is pretty good. And I think I came to a different perception of what Mexican cuisine is, Mexican cooking, Mexican food after living here. So, and I, th and I see like in the media sometimes that, you know, the perceptions of what food is, it's like, oh, that's not really it. So a little bit is, you know, it's like I, I'm setting the record straight or there's more to it than you think. And I'll, I'll go back the other way because when you talk to people in Mexico, everyone thinks the cuisine of the U.S. is, hot, oh, well, Americans only eat hot dogs and hamburgers, which isn't true. They eat lots of hot dogs and hamburgers, but there are many other things. So it goes back the other way. So there's just, there's more to it. But I think a lot of it is just, I, more than anything, it's like, I think it's cool. I think it's fun. I think it's interesting. And so I want you to know about it. Try it out. It's pretty cool. My, my favorite dish, I think overall, I like pozole. Pozole makes me happy. It's a, it's Mexican comfort food. It just makes you feel happy. So, and then probably because pozole usually comes with a social event, uh, because it's part of, it seems like every social event, when you get together, you have pozole. Or mole. Or mole. Where I am right now, every social event is, is pozole. It's always pozole. It's not so much mole here. You know, there, I'm in the state of Guanajuato and there is a mole Guanajuato. But in general, when you, when you have, like for Independence Day at the Independence Day party, every single house has pozole. And what kind of pozole is your favorite? Because, uh, the audience might not be aware of the fact that in Mexico, we have a big variety of pozoles that can be prepared in a number of ways, depending on the flavoring you want to mm -hmm. add and also yeah. the meat you put in. Yeah. So what is your favorite? My favorite pozole is a pork pozole. Um, the red pozole, because okay. there's red pozole, green pozole, white pozole. Yeah. And then also the chilies that you put into it. Right now in Guanajuato, they make pozole with chili guajillo. Uh -huh. And I I learned a different way of making it with different chilies when I was in the north. And it's more using the anchos, a uh, base of anchos and pasillas. Mm -hmm. Which is a sweeter kind of uh, flavor. Yeah, and it's a little stronger than it's uh, in, not spicy stronger, but a little stronger just in flavor. Um, and mm -hmm. so... I guess it's a red pork pozole with, you know, with the anchos and pasillas would be my favorite pozole. That is a great choice. And a quick note for the listeners. If you want to listen to the full story of how pozole came to be and why since the beginning has been a great social event, go back to the archive of Fazi Chifotle and there is uh, one episode that talks about the kind of meat, or should I say flesh, that used to go into a pozole. But, but bear in mind that we don't use warriors to prepare our pozole. <laughs> <laughs> so that's always good news. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, well, Douglas, thank you for being so generous with your time, for sharing your personal story uh, and all this um, evolution of your work and obviously so much that you put into this project, as, as we all do. I really hope you can successfully continue transforming the way people approach Mexican food and Mexican culture, of course, and, and, and your voice really contributes to this inclusive conversation across nations. 
I would like you to mention uh, how can people reach you, how can they contact you, how, how can they uh, reach to your work, social media accounts. Okay, um, you can find us, um, or the website is mexicanfoodjournal.com. That's probably the easiest place to find us. We're on Facebook also, Twitter and Instagram for social media. You'll find us there. And I guess that, that's how you get a hold of us or find out what we're doing. Um, they can write me at Douglas at MexicanFoodJournal.com if they want to get in touch with me by email. Very good. If you've already listened to that, visit the Mexican Food Journal and get in touch with Douglas if you want to know more information about his project. If you want to book a class, you can even make some easy mole or a delicious pozole. Thank you, Douglas, again. Uh, I really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, I had fun. Great. Well, that's it for this interview. Don't forget to go to Douglas's website and we we'll return with the show after this short break. Day and night, the busy streets of Mexico's town and cities are constantly buzzing with music, people, and the delicious smells that emanate from an unimaginable and amazing range of foods, snacks, and drinks. The latest issue of Sabor, This is Mexican Food, celebrates the world's famous Mexican street food and the cultural value of the nation's rich and ethnically diverse cooking traditions. With more than 16 emblematic recipes from the Grand Mexican Street Food Repertoire and five in-depth articles exploring memorable stories of immigration and entrepreneurship, of family recipes and shared cultures to inspire you making a delicious cultural feast. To know more about the wonderful articles and recipes to bring the irresistible Mexican street food into your home, go to pasechipotle.com forward slash magazine. Take Sabor with you on all your digital devices. Go to pasdechipotle.com forward slash magazine and get ready to cook, learn and enjoy Mexican food like you never imagined. Wait, but there is more. Now, here is some extra material from this conversation. I always try to teach people that if you kind of have a general sense on how to make, if you can make the simple mole and you know, and you kind of know what to watch for, you can make one of the complicated ones with all the ingredients. It's the same thing. You know, if you can make one great salsa, you can take those same abilities and it applies to a thousand other ones. And there's, there's a sense that if you get a few core kind of techniques and, and a sense of how things are done, you can all of a sudden start to do a lot more. And it's really not that hard. And like you said, is uh, you know getting the foundation and the reference, the, the the flavor reference. Yeah. Well, it was interesting. I was the one thing that I thought was I was going to get a lot of trouble for is like, oh, you know, you're American. How can you talk about Mexican food? I have had the opportunity to travel and live abroad. I know too well what it means to really fall in love with the you know, heritage and, and cuisine of other countries and have a very respectful but a very personal take on it. Like, I, I understand exactly where you, where you are and, 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 and why you are doing it and the way you are doing it because yeah. I've been there. I am there. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, you know, but, well, there's sort of the authenticity police sometimes and when you read these food blogs and stuff, funny little things or, or guacamole must have lime juice. I'll take Diana Kennedy's word, guacamole doesn't have lime juice. And that's one thing I, I, I do in almost every class is we make a guacamole and a mocajete. And well, where's the lime? It's like, you're not putting lime in. No, 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 you have to. Oh, freak out. My opinion that in the U.S., they put so much lime juice in the guacamole that it covers the flavor of everything else. And so that's the flavor that they know for guacamole. It's basically lime juice. I know, I mean, I, and I like guacamole with just a little splash of lime in it, a few drops, adds a little nice acidity to it. I said, you know, humor me, follow along, we're gonna, and it'll blow your mind. And they said, oh my God, wait till I take this home and we do this at the next party. And a lot has to do when you make it in the molquejete, 
it's a whole te- texture, taste, changes the chemistry that the that the crush, you know, using the molcajete to crush a little bit of the onion and, and stuff, and a, and by by crushing it into a paste, it releases releases all the essential oils from from the onion, as opposed to when you just mix it with a fork. When you bite into it, you get a little a little bit of onion. The one thing that every every group every group I've ever taught says at the end of the class was. I didn't know it was so easy. And part of it comes down to the media. The media is always selling you the idea that cooking is hard. Cooking is complicated. That's why you need to buy our products. We make it easy. And so people have this sense, oh, it must be really hard. And, and it's always, oh, that was so easy. Now you can make mole. And it's, but because Mexican cuisine is really, it comes out of home cooking. You don't need to know chef techniques to make molecular gastronomy. To, to create really great food. Even at its complex, like say chiles de nogada, it's just mastering the skill because if nuns could do it in the 16th century, my God, you can. There are certain things that I'm good at and I'm, I'm a good teacher. Like if you ask me something about, you know, some Chile and some part of Mexico, I can't answer you. And I start doing the cooking classes and they're, by, they're six hours long by the time we're done. I talk for six hours straight. It's a show and it's really weird. It's like I'm possessed. And, and so, and it's like, how did I remember that? Where did that come from? And, and, but I can talk about, you know, talk about things and techniques and the history of things. And it's like, and I don't, it doesn't come across in my writing. When you teach, you learn to analyze your audience. You know quickly, are they having a good time? Are they with me? Did I lose them? I don't know if you've noticed, but almost all of the best food blogs, I would say a minimum of 50% are, are all by school teachers. It's, it's really interesting. Basically, teachers know how to explain things. Thanks for, thanks for the chat. No, thank you, Douglas. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. You can find all the links mentioned on today's interview on the description of the show and including a link to subscribe to my newsletter. On this episode's blog post, you will find some extra material, including one of Douglas's favorite recipes. The next episode will feature an interview with Carla Sasueta, author of the blog Mexican Food Memories. Carla is a Mexican expert and cooking teacher extraordinaire who has been living for way over a decade in London. Mexican food is having quite a moment in the UK, but no doubt Carla has been one of the pioneers in introducing tacos, tamales and good salsas to Shakespeare's good old Albion. You really don't want to miss that one. Well, thank you for listening and see you all online. Follow me on Instagram, find me as at Rocio underscore Carvajal C. Find the show on Twitter as Chipotle Podcast. That's it for this week, my friends. Until the next time. <laughs>